coal is where you find it, and it's found in quantity in the open cast seams of the Buller coal field in New Zealand's South Island. Rough country, this, and the coal, useless unless you can get it away. It adds up to men, machines, and delay, especially in bad weather. There's always an empty truck in place as a full one moves off, but a roadway is at best a bottleneck. Something better's needed if you're to speed up the coal. A mile and a half from the workings, that something better is now to be found. Here, the 3,500 weight buckets of a new aerial ropeway take over. A 600,000 pound airlift, which can carry 250 tons of coal every hour. Hills and escarpments are taken in a stride. When finished, the ropeway will carry the output of three drift mines and the open cast workings high over the rugged hills, a distance of nearly six miles. Safety nets are slung across roads at five points on the route. Loop stations take the strain wherever transfer to a new section of cable has to be made. The whole project is a triumph of British technical skill and New Zealand engineering enterprise. One hundred and twelve steel pylons carry the cables from the hilltop mines to the sea. The most spectacular engineering achievement is the crossing of Mine Creek Gully, 350 feet deep and 1,700 feet across. So the buckets from Stockton Loading Station near the end of a ride which has brought them from 2,600 feet nearly to sea level. Later, coal from two more loading stations will take this same route. Here in the terminal station at Nakawao, they will be discharged into railway wagons, ready for onward transport to the factories of a young nation's industry. Six miles in just over 60 minutes. And now, all the way back with the empties. Speed is thrilling for the driver. It can also be killing for the driver, and many others. So a 50 mile an hour limit on the open highway is enforced by transport department traffic officers to guard the safety of all road users. Clocking fast driving motorists, and then overtaking to deliver the ticket hardly adds to road safety. Two cars at speed instead of one, and a swing out into the middle of the road to pass. To help make our highways safer and reduce accidents, the Dominion Physical Laboratory, already applying microwave electronics to defense and industry, was asked to produce a speed detector of unquestionable accuracy. You know this traffic cop thing they're talking about? Yeah. Well, if we took the Clystron from this lot, put it into this arm, put a load into this arm, and put an aerial on, or something like this, then anything moving about here we could detect. All right, then let's try it. The experimental model is put through its paces. The speeding blades of an electric fan held in the beam provoke a definite response from the detector. No, what we want now is one for the road. When the prototype has been assembled, it's given a bench workout to check for accuracy and for calibration in miles per hour. The higher the speed, the higher the note. Calibration, okay, Joe? Yes. Good. All right, well, put the lid on and uh, let the transport department try it. Out on a main highway, the microwave detector is put to the test. Using headphones, a traffic officer directs the aerial so that approaching traffic enters the effective arc. 
he lines up on the high frequency tone. The faster the approaching car, the higher the tone. So all the cop has to do now is wait till he hears a high pitched note and then glance at the electronic speedometer. The motorist could easily defeat the detector. No science needed either. All he has to do is keep within the speed limit. Traffic 1 to AM18. Traffic 1 to AM18. Come in 18. Over. AM18 to traffic 1. OK, over. 1, coming up for you. 5, 1, 2. Four, four, five, one, two, four, four. Speed six five. Time two thirty p.m. And it was a cream Vauxhall. A cream Vauxhall. Would you repeat that message, please? Over. Uh, one, eight, one, two, one. After repeating the message as a double check, the cop on the receiving end, or rather the dishing out end, watches and waits for the speedster possibly cogitating on the reaction of this driver when he's courteously informed that he's been picked up at 65 miles an hour by the microwave detector. The surprise effect of the detector is apt to produce a wide variety of reactions, from plain abuse to passing the buck. Well, uh, it's all your fault. If you hadn't fallen asleep, I wouldn't have had a chance to touch up to 65. Well, don't blame me. The moment I take my eyes off you, you get into some oh, sort of bother. Let me see women. An added advantage of this remarkable detector is its very long range, making it possible for just one cop to set it up on a nice stretch of road and, like a spider, wait for the unwary speeding motorist. The backroom boys at the Dominion Physical Lab have certainly turned out an instrument of infallible accuracy that's easy to operate, and it's guaranteed to pick up the fast ones. In fact, if it weren't so infallible, it could be said to be almost human. <coughs> From Milford Sound, passing 5,600 foot Mitre Peak with its ruff of cloud, the Launch Alert takes research workers on a cruise at the end of summer. Great glaciers hollowed these sunken valleys during the Southern Ice Age. Bowen Falls demonstrate the sidewall's steepness. Heading seaward, Alert meets a school of sea cows, cumbrous cousins of the more agile dolphin. Now in doubtful sound, other forms of animal life, plant-like forms, are dredged from a depth of 30 fathoms. Just come to hand is a crinoid, or sea lily. When placed in water, the crinoid is seen to be related to a starfish. Another rare specimen from the far south is a branch of tree coral, festooned with brittle stars and sea worms. Further south again comes Brake Sea Island. Seals are recolonizing along this coast, in the last century, they were almost exterminated for oil and skins. Today, they're protected. The purpose of this cruise is scientific. Dr. Faller of the Dominion Museum goes ashore to record the present size of the seal colony. Estimating seal numbers is not just counting heads. Tails, too, must be considered. Near Resolution Island, Alert pokes her nose into an unnamed waterfall. In Acheron Passage, where fish have never seen hook and line before, reprovisioning is easy. Past Resolution Island and into Dusky Sound, entering a narrow passage leading to Sealer's Cove. In 1775, Captain Cook spent six weeks in Dusky Sound careening his ship Resolution. To his crew, perhaps, this was the best known part of New Zealand. Today, it's almost forgotten and entirely uninhabited. 